All right, hey, welcome everybody. This is uh, the start of uh, week three. And the first thing I wanna say is I hope that uh, the uh, test went well for you. Um, this is the, uh, you know, First time going through a uh, uh, online test here on, on Canvas, uh, at least for me and maybe even for you. Uh, and so, like I said, hopefully that went well and you were able to submit it. Uh, let me remind you that um, your homeworks, chapters one through six, and, chap and, and your labs, those first four labs, uh, all of that stuff is due by midnight tonight, okay? And so this is June 1. This is the first day of June. And so finally the first due date has come there. So I know a lot of you have been communicating with me and I, I think we've got all the bugs worked out and I deliberately set it as one big package uh, towards the end here of this uh, first week. So I... Uh, Hope everything will work out. And as I said in my email over this weekend, and I hope that wasn't too long of an email, but I, I wanted to really explain the structure of the of the test and kind of summarize what we've done and uh, hopefully answer any and all questions that you guys might have had. Although, again, feel free to uh, send me some uh, questions. Uh, <clears throat> so as we get started in what I guess I'll call the, the second third of the uh, semester, and so this is the... Uh, third week. Um, let's take a look here at the syllabus and at the schedule. And so as I hold it up here and I look here, uh, we are uh, starting work, uh, week three here. Uh, there it says June 1. And of course, there it says test number one, chapters one through six. And so that's what you you already did. And then uh, if this was a face-to-face -face class, we would have said, okay, take the test, take a little break, come back here, and I'll set up the equipment. And so, so that's where we are now. And so we're ready for our uh, second part of the uh, class today, and so it's chapter uh, seven. And so let's do chapter seven. Uh, maybe not finish all of it. Uh, let's see how far we get. But you'll see that tomorrow we have the rest of chapter seven and, and, and chapter eight to do. And then on Wednesday we get started into chapter 11. So we make a little bit of a, of a jump there. Uh, and I will point out it's also a shift of gears. And so we're going to leave mechanics after uh, chapter eight. But let me not get ahead of myself. Uh, chapter eight's a big chapter. So I want to get as much done with chapter seven here today as we can on energy uh, before we get into rotations. And uh, the chapter eight is a, is a long chapter and we uh, never seem to have enough time for, for that chapter. Uh, summer school even more so because summer school, as you know, is kind of a rushed one. Now, um, I'll also uh, take a look here at uh, the labs. No, maybe I'll wait for lab on that. All right, so uh, let's get started here. And um, I'm going to then begin here <clears throat> by introducing you to the new quantity. And as I've been saying since uh, day one, every day we start with something new, a new idea, a, a new question, if you will. And that's what today is. And so today here, I'll just put chapter uh, seven. Uh, the title of it is energy. And the main idea, the main principle is conservation of energy. Oh, hey, Ron, did we do a sound check? We? Yeah. All right. Sounds good. All right. Um, and so with that in, in mind here, uh, let me put the first word here on the board and say, what is work? What is the definition of work? And let me put the second one up here, which is energy. And we'll have a few more before today's over. But, but this is the beginning of this chapter. This is the main part of this uh, chapter. As I said, the main point hopefully you'll get here before today's done is the principle of conservation of, of energy. And so work then has this definition. It is force times distance. Um, I'll even put distance moved. But here's an important caveat that is going to be extremely important and sometimes hard to uh, see or understand. But hopefully you'll, you'll, you'll catch this. Uh, the distance that it moves is the distance in the direction of the force. Uh, let me expand on that in just a, a second. Because if I were to do kind of a, a symbolic notation here, I would just say, all right, there's the force. And so I'll put F for force uh, times distance. So I'll just put a D there. I don't really have a symbol here for the direction uh, 
the, the movement in the direction of the, of the force, but like I said, it, that's important, and so let me expand on that. So this D needs to be remembered. It's not just distance, but it's the distance in the direction of the, of the force. And then for work, I'll just put a little W. Maybe I'll try to squeeze a box around here and say, okay, this is our definition of, of work. And as you'll to see here, this looks a lot like the last chapter, and rightfully so. Uh, you might remember, if I, we go back a chapter, to momentum. Uh, momentum was a product of two things we um, already knew, mass and velocity. And what that led to was that the change in momentum is force multiplied by, by time. And what we said then is if you had two objects, and so here is cart number one, let's say, and it is moving along and collides into cart number two. And our argument in the last chapter, I want to extend that into this chapter by saying that during this collision, uh, there would be a force, I'll just put it up here, as number one hits number two, but likewise, because of Newton's third law, uh, there would be a force equal and opposite on cart number one coming from cart number two. So I'll put a little force there and an arrowhead to indicate the force on, on number one. And since those two are equal but opposite, if I multiply by the contact time, then I'm going to get over here the change in momentum of number one and over here the change in momentum in number two and, and our argument last chapter which is going to be an extension of what we're going to do here today was to say that since the forces are equal and the contact time is equal the change in momentums must be equal. Now maybe I should be careful equal and opposite. Because a force is equal and opposite. So in other words, one lost momentum and the other one gained momentum. And because of that, we said that you could use this principle that we called conservation of momentum. And of course, what we meant by that, and we made these little charts that said, okay, take the amount of momentum before the collision and set it equal to the amount of momentum after the collision. Okay, we're going to really do the same thing. Coming over to here, you can kind of see the same process. If I use the two carts again, I would then say, all right, I have these carts here. And so I'll just draw another picture of cart one and cart two. But again, as they interact, we could take advantage of Newton's third law. Uh, we could say there would be a force on number two. Uh, there would be a force on number one. That force would be equal and opposite. And as they hit each other and they push on each other, there would be a distance that number two travels. There would also be a distance that number one travels during this collision, during this, this impact. And so if we call this the work and then eventually the, the energy, what we're going to end up saying, and again, give me a few minutes to kind of build this up, but we're going to have the same basic idea that one of them may be losing some energy and the other one then is gaining some energy. And so if we look at the, the two of them, we will say there's this principle of conservation of, of energy. And that's what I want to build up to here is to say what is energy and from that why do we care about it and we care about it because of this principle of conservation of energy. And so the best way to begin I think today's chapter is to say that there are these three very important conservational principles in mechanics. Uh, the first one you already saw. The first one may not 
you know, have seemed that grand or maybe it didn't seem like it was going to be that important to completely understand the details because you didn't know three of them were coming at you. But what we like to say is there are three extremely important conservational and powerful conservational principles in mechanics. And the first one you just saw already, it's the momentum, that's from chapter six. And I'm trying to introduce you to uh, the second one here, which is energy, and you'll see then tomorrow the third one, which will be conservation of angular momentum and so it'll kind of follow this this same pattern but I'm hopeful you will see that today as well as tomorrow just like we did last lecture we will make this little table we will say okay take the amount before the collision or interaction I should say and then set that equal to in this case the energy after the event the interaction and so we're going to do a lot the same today that we did in last chapter and we'll do it again when we get into chapter eight with angular momentum and so that hopefully kind of gives a bigger overall picture of the conservational principles not just the individual conservational principles but again hopefully that's what you're you're learning here chapter by chapter the individual uh, uh, principles here. All right, so I'll say it again. Here, here's my goal here, and I'm starting off with just this whole idea, what is work and what is that slight subtlety difference between work and energy, but eventually going to get to the point to convince you that there's this very important principle called conservation of energy. Okay. Hey, welcome back. Uh, I don't, hopefully this will uh, spice together really well. Looks like we just had a little uh, power failure and uh, the camera went out. And uh, anyways, we're, we're back up and, and, and running. Uh, so we'll, we'll edit those together and hopefully that will look good. Let me go back to where I was when uh, the power failure occurred. And that was this big picture. I'm trying to show you the conservation of energy. So let's keep talking here and I'll go back to this definition here of, of work. So I'll put it over here. Work equals force times distance. And let me begin with kind of a, a boring case, but an important one. What if I come over here to this table? And I say, all right, I'm going to push on this table. And so I'm going to stand here and I'm going to push with about 500 newtons of force. And I guess I'll do this for, I don't know, 10 seconds or so. And here's my first question. How much work did I do? And I hope you see the answer to that is zero, right? Because work is both force and distance. And so this would be 500 newtons times zero meters, which comes out to be zero. And so again, work is a combination of two things. And if one of those is zero, you're not going to get any work. And maybe that's obvious. But, but let me watch this one too. What if I come over to here and I'll take one of these really nice carts that roll really well. And I'll get my little bit of space in front here. And I give it a little nudge. And I just watch it roll across the table. Now, let me emphasize. I, I'm not talking about the part where my hand gives it a nudge, okay? Forget that part for just a moment. We'll come back to that. But as my hand gives it a little nudge, and now I let go. Okay, so now I've let go. And it's just moving along. This is Newton's first law, right? Newton's first law that an object in motion would continue in motion forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Okay? Even though there's not a force on it. All right, so one more time. So here's my hand, okay? Now my hand lets go of it. Oh, and I hope I gave it enough, but I wanted to just kind of keep going and in a, in, in a slow sense. And so this is Newton's first law. And, and so I'm just going to ask you during that time, while it was moving, as it's moving across this table. Now, not while my hand is touching it, how much work did I do? And again, I hope you see that during that episode, there was no force. 
Now, it moved, and I, I didn't measure it uh, really well, but uh, it was roughly, if I put a meter stick up here, one meter. And so I'll put one meter, but I still get zero. And that's what I want to keep emphasizing here at the beginning here is work is both a force and a distance. You have to have both of them. Uh, I like to say you have to have an effort and a result. And so the effort is the force and the distance it moved is the result. And so over here, this one, I never got a result. I put in an effort and I pushed on it, but I never got any result. It didn't actually move. And then this one over here, this one you might say you get some results, but the effort was never there. Now, I know that you might argue it came from initially your hand. I, yes, okay, so let's come back to that. So initially my hand gave it the effort. But once I've let it go, well, it just keeps going. Uh, we would say the, the momentum keeps it going. So, so the result isn't it because of any effort. The, the result is just from what you might call previous effort. And the momentum just keeps it going. So there is no more effort, but there is a result. And so again, this is a strict definition that would say there is zero uh, work. And so again, be very careful with this definition because just because you have a force doesn't mean you have work or just because you have distance doesn't mean you have work because either one of those could be zero. Now finally let me get to something a little more interesting here. Let's take that initial push by my hand. Let me come over here and put the the meter stick up here. Uh, let me put the front of the cart roughly at zero. Let my hand push it maybe to about right here. So that's about 30 centimeters. And so if I start here and give it a little push, and I don't know, I'll just make up a number. Let's say my hand is pushing with 10 newtons. And even though it moved more than 30 newtons, it only moved with a force acting upon it for the 30 newtons. So that's why I would say how much work is done by my hand getting it to a, make that initial movement. And I would say, well, it's a force of 10 newtons. And it's a distance of, uh, and here we have a choice. We could write the distance as 30 centimeters or we could write it as 0.3 meters. And as you have been seeing in the past, well, we like to use these base units, if you will, of meters and uh, seconds and kilograms. And so we'll continue with that. So let me put in in meters. And so when I have 0.3 times 10, uh, that would be 3 and then it would be a newton times a meter. And that's going to introduce us to a joule, and we like to then say the work is measured in these units, joule. A joule is a newton times a meter. A uh, joule was one of these early scientists who were working with this whole idea of work and energy and came up with this uh, theory at first that there is this principle of conservation of energy. That is, the energy lost by one equals the energy gained by uh, the other. And so in his honor, we named the units of energy and work after him. So it's called a, a joule. So I would say this is three joules of, of energy. Now, if you wanted to expand this a little bit more, you could say this, because remember a Newton was a kilogram times a meter over a second squared. So if you multiply it by another meter, uh, you have a kilogram and a meter squared and a second squared. So those would be the appropriate units. And you can see how it, the units are getting pretty involved, pretty complicated as we start multiplying things together. So that's why giving it its own name is, is very useful. And like I said, also very honoring to uh, Joule. And so, so far, 
Uh, you guys have only seen units named after Newton and now Joule, but this pattern is going to continue as we learn more and more of what we'll call, call modern science. So everything kind of past Newton, um, every new idea like uh, temperature, or like uh, pressure, or like um, voltage, uh, like amps, all these are named after the great scientists working in the field. We use a, uh, a, their name in for, the, for the units. All right, so let's call that a, a, a joule. Now, another place that can get confusing is maybe something that is going in a circle. And so let me just take this racquetball on the end of a string again and spin it in a circle. And then we did this back when we did motion in space back in chapter four. And we came up with this, this picture here. Uh, we said that if you had an object and it was moving this way, V, and you pushed it in the direction it was moving, you would say it goes faster. And if you pushed it in a direction opposite that it's moving, uh, it would go slower. And in chapter four, we argued that perpendicular to the direction it's moving is the force from the string. And so this would make it turn. But I'm hoping then, if we take what we already know and add it to this over here, and this is where this piece comes important right there, the distance it moves in the direction of the force, then this force that is making it turn Notice it is perpendicular to the direction it moves. And so how much distance did it move in the direction of the force isn't quite an easy question. Watch, let me, let me try it again. Here's the string. And if I were to ask you how much work is done by this string, I guess I'd come over here and say, okay, the work, which is force times distance, and this string, it felt like I was pulling it as I was spinning it around. I was pulling it maybe with a force of about 25 newtons. But then here's this subtlety question for you. How much distance did it move? How much distance did it move in the direction of the force? You see, if this goes all the way around in a circle, and I'm just gonna visualize this, this circle looks to me like about three meters. But that's not what I put in the equation. I don't put three meters. Because it is the distance in the direction of the force. The force is radially inward. The distance it moves is along the circumference. And so the amount of work is zero joules. Did you catch that little subtlety? Let me say it again. Here is our definition. Here is our new quantity. Our new quantity for today is called work. It is really just a product of two other things we've already talked about, force times distance. But the subtlety here is, in order to have any work, the distance is in the direction of the force. And so like when I pushed on this big uh, desk here, I had a force but no distance. And then over here, when I let it just roll, I had distance without a force. But now I'm trying to show you I have a force and I have a distance, but they're not in the same direction. And so I still get zero work. And so all three of those cases are zero work. The only time you would, would not get a zero work is the case as I showed here, where the force from my hand was pushing the cart this way and the cart moved that way. 
And so that's why I took a force of my hand was 10, and the move, distance it moved was this, these uh, 30 centimeters, or 0.3 meters, and I ended up with actually getting some, some work. Uh, that's another way of saying that looking at this picture right here, any force that makes it change direction doesn't do work. The force that would make it do work would be a force this way and this way. Now maybe when I should say in the direction, I should be a little careful here because opposite is, you know, the same direction. And what I mean really by that is the same axis. This is the x-axis. And so one is positive and, and one is negative, yes, but it's along the x-axis. So the forces that make it go faster or the forces that make it go slower, those do work. But the forces that make it turn don't do any work. And that seems like a little bit of a nitpicky uh, definition, but here's where, again, it is important. You will see here that the principle of conservation of energy will only work out if we say we're going to limit the distance to just the part of the distance that is in the same direction as the force. Because the other distances aren't really important uh, in terms of this quantity called work and eventually we'll get to, to energy. And so there is that little subtlety here at the beginning. So I hope you, what you got here out of the beginning is the definition of work and the subtlety that be careful you have to have both force and distance and also be careful that even if you do have a force and a distance like something turning it still doesn't do any work so you have to have a force and a distance but the distance has to be in the direction of that force and so it's a very strict definition but if you if we follow that strict definition there will be times where there is work and when there is work, then it will make it either go faster or if there's negative work, it'll make it go slower. But forces that turn it, in other words, forces that don't make it go faster and slower, those don't do any work. So the work is only done when something goes faster or something goes slower, not when it, it turns. Also, I hope what you got out of this beginning part, I'm just kind of summarizing here, is that the units to measure work is called a, a joule. All right, well, if you got all that, then let's move to the second word here. What is energy? Okay, well, maybe a good layman's definition of energy is this. The ability to do work. Well, isn't that the same as work? Well, no, 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 not quite. It uh, kind of reminds me of a, of, a, of a joke. My uh, kids, when they were younger, loved it. You know, they, were, they just thought it was hilarious. And, you know, in, in the mindset of a four-year-old, that's what they, they think is, is funny. And, you know, they're just learning to subtract. And, and, and basically, the joke goes along this way. There are five birds on a wire. And three of them decide to fly south for the winter. How many birds are left? Uh, two? No. There's five. Because those three, all they did was decide to fly south. They haven't actually done it. They haven't left yet. <laughs> so that's the silly joke. But they thought it was funny. Because, of course, everyone they shared it with, you know, and when you're in kindergarten, you're just learning to subtract, and you know, everybody says two, but no, that's not right. Uh, it, it's a little bit like saying this. <clears throat> is your room clean? Is your car clean? In other words, do you have the ability to clean your room? And did you clean your room are really two different questions. Don't mix those two. Just because you have the ability doesn't mean it actually gets accomplished. Now, bringing that a little more to home, when it's a face-to-face -face class, I, I look at the students, I say, okay, do you guys have the ability to get straight A's? Do you get straight A's? Or do you have the ability to graduate from college? And will you graduate from college? 
You see, just making a decision here, and I hope you all have, it's why you're here, you realize the importance of getting a bachelor's degree. And in today's work environment, you, to be successful, you need a bachelor's degree. So all of you are here going, I have made a decision to get a bachelor's degree. And I also hope all of you will put in the required effort to get the bachelor's degree. But just making a decision about cleaning the room doesn't mean you actually do it. There is a lot more that has to go behind that to get the room clean or to get the car clean or to fly south or in your case to actually graduate from college. There's a lot more steps you need to do to get to that career. And so making the decision or having the ability to do it is not the same as actually doing it. Because I'm convinced all of you have the ability to get your bachelor's degree. Sadly, statistically, not all of you will get your degree. But you all have that ability. So that's my kind of my silly way of trying to say, when we say something has the ability to do work, uh, that just literally means the ability. It doesn't mean it's going to happen. That's a whole nother step. And so humans, I think, almost every human uh, has the ability to get a bachelor's degree. Now, it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of sacrifice to get there. I get that. But you have that ability. Whereas my dog, for example, doesn't have the ability. I, I don't care how hard I work or how hard my dog works. I can never teach my dog how to read and write and, and do physics and to do algebra. It, it, the dog just doesn't have it in them. And so not everything has the ability to do work. But those things that do have the ability are then we say they have energy. And so we say they have energy even though they're not doing the work. Uh, watch. Let's see if I can give a, a, a kind of a silly example here. Uh, let's take this cart. And again, this cart can start here, and I give it a little nudge. So that's the work I did. Then, of course, it moves across the, the track here. And so as it's moving across the, the track, and I don't really have a very level track here, but hopefully close enough. But right now, as it's moving across... When my hand's not touching it, and we, we asked this before, any work being either done on the cart or by the cart? Then I would say no. It's moving, yeah, so it has distance. But there's no force, assuming I get it level. And so again, I would say, no, I, there, there's no, there's no work being done. Okay. So in other words, it's just moving. Okay. But, and here's where the silliness comes in here. What if I put something in its path? I'll just stack these five blocks here. I still don't have it level. And when the cart hits the blocks, is it now work being done? Isn't that cart doing work on the blocks? Isn't that cart putting a force on the blocks? And you could probably even see it slid them a little bit. So I'd say there's both a force and a distance. So I would say, is this moving cart then doing work on the blocks? <laughs> and I'd say yes. The fact that it was moving then, and here's the catch, means it has the ability to do work. Now, just because it's moving, it doesn't mean it does the work, right? I mean, watch. Watch what happens when I, I set these same blocks off to the side of the cart. And now it's moving. Did the cart do any work on the blocks? No. It didn't hit them. You, you missed it. <laughs> but I would say that because of the motion, because it's actually moving, if it then is moving in the right direction and collides into those set of blocks, it then will do the work. And so what we like to say here is a moving object then has the ability to do work. 
It may or may not actually do the work. It really depends if it hits it. And so we would then say that a moving object has energy. It doesn't actually do any work until it actually hits it. And that's the slight subtlety here between energy and work. Now, I must say that this slight subtlety is oftentimes really not that important. It's like uh, there is a subtlety difference between speed and velocity. And sometimes that was important. And sometimes we, we had a, uh, to distinguish that and we made a discussion on that. But a lot of times we were just, for example, calculating how much time would it take to get there and we just really needed the magnitude of the speed, which uh, velocity, which we called speed. And there really wasn't that important to distinguish between the two. And same thing is going to be said here, that these are actually uh, a slight difference. This is the ability to do it. This is when it actually does it. Although if it actually does it, you might say the amount of work was equal to the energy and then you're going to say it's one and the same. And so when the energy actually does result in work being done, we don't distinguish between the two. And I think that's why, just like speed and velocity, are very easily confused because sometimes they are the same and other times they are not. Work and energy are sometimes uh, confused. And so I guess this is a long way of saying we then are trying to point out that if something is moving, we will call this an energy of motion. Uh, it has energy if it's moving because it may collide into something and put a force on it. It may not do. So it may not do work. But it does have energy. It has the ability to do work. And so we refer to this as a kinetic energy. And so anything that's moving has kinetic energy. Okay? And so there's our big fancy word for today. And in fact, before today's over, uh, or maybe it'll flow into tomorrow's lecture too, uh, but I'm going to introduce you to three types of, of energy. And this is the first. This is kinetic energy. But we're going to have what we call gravitational potential energy and we're going to have what we call heat energy. Uh, there are many other forms of energy. Um, and we'll look a little bit at electrical energy and light energy and sound energy. But those will just brush on uh, as we do this chapter and they'll come into play as we continue on with this semester and learn more more physics. But to get us started with the idea of energy we need a few and these three work really well. Kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, and heat energy. And then we can add later on sound energy, and light energy, and electrical energy, and nuclear energy. And I think that's about all we'll, we'll, we'll cover before the uh, semester is, is over. So like I said, energy is just the ability to do work. And if that ability work to do work comes from its motion, we call it a kinetic energy. Now, if that's the, the kinetic energy, um, there must be some kind of formula. And sure, there is. Uh, why don't I abbreviate kinetic energy with just uh, KE for kinetic energy. And your author and myself, uh, like I did with uh, the centripetal acceleration V squared over R, I said that um, it involves a little bit of calculus. And uh, so I will prove that to you next uh, semester. Um, or, <laughs> and I caught myself again, I'm not teaching 121 next semester. So if you take it next semester, you'll take it with uh, Professor Folsom. He'll prove that to you. Um, and then likewise, uh, and I think in that survey book, that's like chapter six. And then in chapter seven, uh, there's this one, the uh, kinetic energy. And then I'm going to just say the same thing. There's a little bit of calculus involved. And so next semester, we'll prove that to you in physics uh, 121. But the formula then is one half times the mass of the object times the speed squared. And so without deriving the equation, let me just put the equation on the board and then say, let's talk about the equation. Let's talk about the result. Because you don't really need to understand at this point how it is derived. 
in order to use it. And, and so notice a couple of things in this equation. And the first most important one here is V. V is the velocity. And so if you have more speed, you have more kinetic energy. And, and maybe that's obvious here. And so if you, you know, have this block here, and you, this card is barely moving at a low speed, we say it has energy, sure, because it has the ability to do work. And you saw it right there. Hit the blocks and move them a little bit. But they'd only moved them a little bit. It was a small force for a small distance. And, and we would say it only had the ability to do a small amount of work. But if it was going fast. Now, oh, it could put a big force for a big distance and do a lot of work. So again, it makes sense that we would see that in this formula for the kinetic energy, which is the energy of motion, an important piece of it would be its speed. How fast is it going? So the more speed, the, the more energy it has. But the second thing here is notice it's quadratic with the speed. So if you were to double the speed, how much more energy would you have? And I hope you're saying four times. If we tripled the speed, how much more energy would we have? And I hope you're saying nine times because it is the speed squared. And so three times squared, three times three is nine. Now watch, let's, let's put some numbers in here. Let's go ahead and calculate the kinetic energy of that cart uh, you've heard me say it many times that the mass of that cart is a half a kilogram. And why don't I give it a speed of one meter per second at first, then I will give it a speed twice that at two meters per second. And then let me give that a speed of three meters per second, three times the original. And let's run through some math and, and see what we have here. Okay, so let's see. I have a one squared, that's a one, times a half times another half, that makes overall a quarter. So I'll put that as 0.25. Uh, let me hold off on the units for just a second. Uh, let's try this one here. 2 squared is a 4. Uh, half of that is 2. Half of that is 1. Ah, there it is. From here to here, I doubled the speed. How much more energy do I have here compared to there? Yeah, 4 times more. Mm, let's try this one. Uh, this is 3. And if I square it, that's nine. Uh, take half of that, that's four and a half. Uh, take half of that, that is, uh, ooh, two and a quarter. And again, this might take a little more work here, but if you take a quarter and you multiply by nine, which is nine quarters, you get 2.25. So I'll say it again, I hope you see in this little formula that the big piece of this is, and the reason we call it a kinetic energy, is it's energy of motion. It may or may not actually do work, it may or may not collide into that block, which is why we call it an energy, we don't call it a work. Now if it actually collided into it, then we would say it did work, okay. But just the fact that it's moving, and so a car going down the street, not colliding into anything, just moving down the street, we would say it has energy. It has the ability to do work. And of course, it makes sense that the greater the speed, the, the greater the amount of kinetic energy. But what I want you to also see is it's not just speed, you know, raised to a power of one. It's not just, hey, if you double the speed, you double the energy. No, you double the speed, you quadruple the energy. If you triple the speed, your, your energy is nine times that amount. See, that's why, 
you'll hear uh, safety officers, so particularly the uh, CHP, uh, say, you know, the the most dangerous thing on the road is speed. That's, that's what it is. The amount of kinetic energy that a car has at 75 miles an hour compared to, say, 50 miles an hour is a lot more. And it's much more difficult to stop that. Uh, the, 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 the accidents, the crashes, the damage, much, much, much higher. There's just a lot of energy. You may not think much about it just going from 50 to 70 or 50 to 75. You know, and you go, oh, that's only a 50% increase. But remember, 1.5 squared then is uh, 225. And so you have, you know, uh, you know, you go from... One, two, I mean, that's over 100%. It's 125% more energy just going from 50 miles an hour to, to 75 miles an hour. And so that, that, that's a big change. And that's what I'm trying to emphasize, what we what we call in math a nonlinear uh, behavior. And so at high speeds, the quadratic nature really makes that a, a, a big uh, number. Now, let me also then point out here the units. <clears throat> and so if you look at the units, uh, this would be a kilogram. And then over here, we would have the meters squared. So there'd be my meters squared. And then over here, I would have my seconds squared. And we mentioned this a few moments ago. This is our new unit for today. It's called a joule. And so this is 0.25 joules. This would be then one joule. And then this would be 2.25 joules. And so we would say that this car has an energy of, and we would label it in, in joules. And it's not a surprise, I don't think, that the units for energy are the same as the units for work. Because remember, what is energy? The ability to do work. So sometimes the energy actually does work. So you want to be using the same units for what it actually does, even if it, you know, didn't do it, but it has the ability to do it. So when it does actually do the work, you'd be measuring it the same way. It, it would be a little bit like saying, ah, I don't have a job because I'm so busy being a student that I don't have time for a job. Uh, that's kind of my, you know, uh, way of getting through life is, look, I'm going to go just get some loans so I can get through school. And once I get my bachelor's, then I can pay off the loans because then I'm going to have a really better paying job and blah, 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 blah. So that's a great strategy. But the point here is, if you don't have a job, but yet maybe you have a, some, some skills, maybe uh, besides taking the physics class, maybe you've taken some of our web design classes. And so you're, you're really good with the media arts and you could build a, a web page and, uh, 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 and maybe one of these e-commerce uh, pages and you know, people can buy and sell uh, shoes. You know? and, and so you have a really powerful skill that if you weren't taking classes, maybe you could go get a job for $20 an hour. And you go, okay, I'm not actually having a job. I'm not making $20 an hour. But you would say, I have a skill that I could get a job. In other words, I have the ability to have a job that would pay me $20 an hour. And there's my point. You have the ability. And look at the units you're using. It's $20 per hour. It's actually the same units that if you actually did it. So if you actually got the job, you would say, I am making $20 an hour. If you just have the ability to make $20 an hour, again, you would say, I have the ability to make $20 per hour. But you would use the same units. And that's what I'm, I'm getting at here. So not a surprise that the units for work and the units for energy are the same. So as I said, this first part of the chapter, this is what I really wanted to do. I just wanted to get the distinction between work and energy, and, and in general what they are, and then what the units are. And I, I think I, I got that uh, uh, across here uh, pretty well. Now I'll say one more thing here, just because maybe it'll drive home this whole V squared, is remember this work is force times distance. And so a number of your homework problems will be centered around this equation. 
uh, we often refer to this as the work energy equation. Because if I were to come up here and say, as we did a little while ago, let me start it again. And take this cart and say, okay, I'm going to put this cart right at the beginning of this meter stick. And I'm going to give it a nudge for 30 centimeters. Now, it's not much of a push. It's only 10 newtons. So I'm going to give it a push, about 10 newtons, and then let it go. And of course, as we said, once you let it go, after the first 30 centimeters, it moves on its own. There's no more work being done. That's Newton's first law. An object in motion will continue in motion unless acted upon by a force. But I might ask this question. What is that speed once I got to the 30 centimeters? Of course, I could also ask it at 20 and at 15, but I'll just go at 30. And that's where this would become very, very useful because here's really what I'm saying. The work that I did with my hand, the work I was giving it showed up as its, its energy. Now it has the ability to do that work. And so I gave it my effort, if you will. Now it has motion. Now it has the ability to do work. And then later on it may actually do that work. It may collide into that box. But not going that far, I would just ask this question, how fast is it going? And so let me apply that equation. And so it would look something like this. I'd say one half times the half a kilogram times V squared. And then here's my force, 10 newtons, uh, for a distance of 0.3 meters. And of course, as we did earlier, we said that comes out to be 3 joules. And so now, I can solve this for its speed. And I think I'll need a calculator then for this one. Um, let me go ahead and maybe I'll just write here V squared. And I'll put my numbers together. There's the three. And then I guess over here I would put the one half underneath it. And I would put the two up on top and the units then would be a joule over a kilogram. Let me then, I guess I don't need a calculator quite yet, but uh, two times three is six uh, divided by a half makes 12, so that's 12. And then I have a joule over a kilogram. Now remember, a joule was this kilogram meters squared over seconds squared. So if you're going to divide it by a kilogram, the kilograms would cancel off. And at this point in my math, I have 12 meters squared over seconds squared. And so my final step then would be to say V equals, and I would need to take a square root. And so let me go, what is the square root of 12? Well, that's 3.46. And then here's the big one. What are the units? And so this is a meter squared. If you take the square root of meter squared, you're going to get, of course, a, a meter. It's like saying take 5 squared and then take the square root. Well, if you take 5, you square it, you get 25. You take the square root, you're back to 5. If you take A and you square it, you get A squared. You take the square root of that, you get A. And so same with the seconds. If I take the square root of seconds squared and then take its square root, I get rid of the square and I just have seconds. And so my unit analysis, as we've been mentioning over and over, worked out well. Uh, that is, I'm asking for what is the speed of the cart. And I know speed comes out to be meters per second. So if I go through all this math and I don't get the right units, I've done something wrong. Fortunately, I did get the right units, meters per second. And so that puts me in confidence feeling that, okay, that's the right uh, formula. I've done things right, and that must be the answer. And so this would be the speed of the cart after the uh, 30 centimeters that I pushed it. And then it would just keep that same speed all the way across. And so that's kind of this, this calcu calculation here. And so again, this work energy theorem. And so you'll see this in the homework 
where they will give you, you know, looks like there's four variables here, and they'll give you three of these and ask you to find the fourth. Now, in this case, I gave you the force and the distance and the mass and asked you to find speed, but it could also be just the other way around. They could have given you the final speed and the mass and then the distance and said how much force uh, did the person's hand push on it to get it that far. And so be on the lookout for a lot of problems like this because of that, like I said, the work goes into the energy. And so that's why we call it the work energy equation here. The work, sometimes we call it the work energy theorem, but I, I, I like the phrase the work energy uh, equation. It works really nice here. All right, well, well let's keep talking because I think I got this first main point across here, work and energy, and I even went a little bit further and said, okay, <clears throat> one of the first bits of energy uh, is referred to as a kinetic energy. And that's true. And so let's try this for a, a moment. Let's look at a collision, an interaction, It'll make a nice review of the uh, last chapter, as well as kind of show us a little bit more about conservation of energy and kinetic energy. But let me set up one car colliding into another one. Uh, let's do the, what I call the easy one. It's the first one we did last chapter. I want to do that one again here. So let me come over here and say, all right, I'll move my blocks here. Uh, let me take this cart, so I'll call this cart number two, and I'll just kind of make it uh, stationary. And here's cart number one. And so here comes cart number one, and it collides into cart number two. Now, now uh, let's not worry about it bouncing off this bumper here. But if you remember doing this one, we did something like this. We said, here comes cart number one with a certain speed. I'm trying to remember the numbers we used. I think it was four. Yeah, four meters per second. So let's, let's do that again. So let's just say I give it enough nudge that it has a speed of four meters per, per second. And maybe I'll start there. And, and what I mean by that is I have a little, well, I have a meter stick here, and there's also one on this side you can't, you can't see. But if I take my hand right here and I push it, this far, that's 10 centimeters, and I want it to have a speed of four, I could ask this question. What force did my hand have to push on it in order to get it to that speed of four in that distance of 10 centimeters? Well, that's exactly what I just was talking about. That's not, this isn't showing you anything new, but let's do that one here. Let's use the work energy theorem, and so here's one-half mv squared equals force times distance. Okay. Now, in this case, the mass being a half a kilogram, and the speed being four meters per second, the uh, speed being four meters per second. The force is unknown. The distance is a tenth of a meter. I can now grab my calculator and say, okay, well, how much force did I need to do in order to get that? And so I'll do this side of the equation first. Let's see, it's one half times one half times four squared, uh, then divided by a tenth, well, I guess, that was an easy one. I didn't really need a calculator for that. But that's 40. And then if you look here at the units, you'll see we have a kilogram. This says meters squared, but remember I'm dividing by that meter, so there's only one meter left over. And then seconds, oh, my apologies. It's four meters per second. No, then we square it. Um, and so it would be seconds squared here. And of course that, is the units for a Newton, and that is good because that would be my unit analysis. Did my uh, units work out right for what I'm looking for? I'm looking for force. Force is measured in Newtons, and it did work out right, so, so that's good. And so I would say here that I am putting a force here of 
40 newtons, all right? So from here to here, I would have to put a force of 40 newtons in order to get it up to that, to that speed. Okay, so now that it has worked up to that speed, watch this. This then comes in and hits. And as we saw in the last chapter, the first one comes to a stop and the second one begins to go. And I asked this question. I said in the last chapter, what is the speed of this one? So if you'll let me jump back to the, to the last chapter and make a little chart here that has to do with momentum. We said, go ahead and take the momentum before the collision and compare it to the momentum after the collision. Okay, so before the collision, I had this M1 V1 plus M2 V2 equals. And if I put in my numbers, I have this half a kilogram going with a speed of four meters per second, and the second one is stationary. And so we came up with two kilogram meters per second. Okay, and then that didn't have a, its own little name like a Newton or a Joule. And you can even go back to the video on this uh, chapter. You see those were exactly the numbers we did before. And then we said, of course, after the collision, it would still be M1 V1 plus M2 V2. Of course, what would be different is the first one came to a stop, so that would be a zero. And the second one still has a mass the same as a half a kilogram, and we're looking for that V2. And so if we bring this and divide, then we can solve here for V2. And so 2 divided by a half is the 4. The kilogram cancels with the kilogram, and we're left with the meters per second. So nothing new here. This is, again, exactly what we did for the momentum. But what I want to do is now look at the energy here. Because if I kind of make this table here, let's look at energy. And let me make a before and an after. And so using the momentum idea first, okay, so I already thought about the, the, the momentum. Let me jump over here and just ask myself, is the energy before even equal to the energy after? Now, as I said at the beginning of this lecture, and I want to get across by the end of the lecture, or at least the end of this chapter, I don't think that will be today. And we got about another, what, 20 minutes or so left for today uh, as part of the lecture. But we'll finish this up tomorrow. But, but I want to emphasize the principle of conservation of energy is going to say that you know that the energy before is equal to the energy after. But let me just use this as a first example to show you. Because if I come over here and I said, okay, before that first cart hit, this was the kinetic energy. After, then this is the kinetic energy. Well, let's see how they compare. All right, so let's see. Before the collision, I had this one half a kilogram going at four meters per second squared. And as we I think calculated a little earlier, this was a, a four, I'll just double check that, but, uh, oh, let me put the square here. But uh, four squared is 16, half of that is eight, half of that is four. So this is four joules. So I would say that my hand gave it a push, giving it enough kinetic energy to have four joules. So once my hand stopped pushing on it, then it had four joules of energy. And that energy then got transferred to the other object. And notice it's the same number. Watch. If I put this number in, 
and this one's kind of boring because it's really the same set of numbers because it's just a different cart, but it's a cart that is a half a kilogram. It's a cart that is now going a speed of four meters per second, which we calculated using the momentum. So let me pause here for a moment. Do you see how I'm using the past chapter momentum as part of my working out this stuff? And, and, and if there's anything hard about this chapter, I would say that's it. If there's anything hard about the, the lab we will do today, the ballistic pendulum, it's the fact that not only is, or do we have to think about the energies involved, but we also have to remember the momentums involved. And so we have both conservational principles happening at the same time. All right, so I used the momentum conservational principle in conjunction with the energy and I got this speed of four and I could do the same thing over here then I could put in that speed of four which which I just did and of course it's the same mathematics comes out to be the same number and this is not a proof that the energy before has to equal the energy after but it is true it is a verification if you will showing you that hey be, card number one before the collision had four joules of energy and of course, the second one had none. So the total of the two was four. And then after the collision, the total of the two is still four. It just now is the second cart has all the energy and the first one has come to a, a stop. And I suppose then to be a little more accurate, I should have put a plus zero and a plus zero to show you that just like over here, to do the principle, I've got to take all the objects before and all the objects after. So same thing here. I need to take all the objects with all their energies and add it together to also all the objects and all their energies. Now, I will be wanting to emphasize here that the principle that I'm showing you here, conservation of energy, again, says the energy before has to equal the energy after. What I showed you was kinetic energy. Because there's nothing in that phrase that says the kinetic energy before has to equal the kinetic energy after. Watch this. Let's try this again. A little harder one this time. Let's try this collision. But this time, let me take this second cart and I'll turn it around so the Velcro will stick. And I'll say, okay, let's start exactly the same way. That is, let me start with the cart number one right here. Let me give it a nudge for 10 centimeters with a force of, what do we come up with, uh, 10 newtons there. No, I'm sorry, 40 newtons. So what ends up happening is this first cart is now going with a speed of 4 meters per second as it approaches the second one. So here it is, 4 meters per second. But this time they stick. Let's look at the momentum first. And again... You can go back to the last chapter. You can look at that video. Uh, it's worth going through here again, mostly because I want you to see that as I try to do the problems for this new chapter, there will be the starting steps of I've got to go back to the other material. I can't forget the momentum stuff that I already learned. And so all the other stuff, like Newton's three laws and conservation of momentum, don't, don't forget those. You will need those to do this chapter. All right, so going back to chapter six on momentum, I could say that the momentum before has to equal the momentum after. And then also what I'm trying to show you new here in this chapter is that the energy before is equal to the energy after. And so this is our new principle here for today. That's the, the part that you could say makes this a, an easy chapter. There's just one big principle here, conservation of energy. But I'll say it again because this one's going to illustrate it. Notice I am not saying 
conservation of kinetic energy. Because that's what happened in the first easy one. The kinetic energy before equaled the kinetic energy after. But as you will hopefully see here in this next step and as we do the rest of this chapter, there are other forms of energy. And so we're going to say the energy is conserved, but we are not going to say it's always kinetic. Uh, watch. Let, let's run through the numbers here. All right. So let's use last chapter's conservation of momentum. And I'll just put M1V1 plus M2V2 before. And, of course, this is exactly the, the same idea. I gave it enough nudge to get it at a speed of 4, and then it's a half a kilogram, and the second one is not moving. And so the momentum before the collision uh, would come out to be this 2 kilogram meters per second. All right, so I'll, I'll just leave that side uh, kind of alone or not do much more with it. We already did that. On this side of the equation, here's where it changes. Uh, in the example I just showed you, the first one stopped. That's why we put a zero here. And then we were asking how fast does the second one go. But in this case, with the Velcro and they stick together, I would say it's M1V plus M2V. And then notice I'm not putting a V1 or a V2 because I do know something about when they stick together. And I said the same thing in the last chapter. When they stick together, you know that they have the same speed. And so that's where the collision is a little different between something like this, where they bounced off each other, as opposed to something like this, where they stuck together. So this comes out to be a half a kilogram times the speed, plus the other half a kilogram times its speed. And a half plus a half makes one, so this is one kilogram times its, its speed. And so to get the speed after the collision, I will just divide by one. And so I get a two meters per second. Notice again the kilograms would cancel off. And again, notice by my unit analysis, I would say that in this collision, using the last chapter, using conservation of momentum, the amount, the, the speed after the collision is only two. And so you can even kind of see that here in this collision here. If I set this up and put my hand here, give it a nudge, and they hit right there, it looks like the two of them together are going slower than before the collision. There's kind of this, this slowing down, and it makes sense. The, the first one, as it collides into the second one, has got to, you know, start pushing it. And so it slows down. The first one slows down while the second one speeds up. And it looks like together they reach a speed of, of, of two. And that's slower had they just bounced off each other. When they bounced off each other, the first one stopped and the second one went. When went. But I want to show you about the energy. Watch this. And so I come over here and I ask this question. Well, how much energy do these two objects have before the collision? And I would say it's exactly the same calculation. So if I could save a little time here, let me not do, uh, have to go through this, but I would have a kinetic energy for the first one, because it's moving, and the second one is, is stationary. And as we calculated, the first one has a kinetic energy of four, so it would be four plus zero, which is a total of, of four. All right, so without redoing that calculation, here is four joules. That's the, the total that you get when you take a speed of four and you square it and then you take half a kilogram times the half in front, you get four. All right, so we have four joules. Now, let me not put, a, I shouldn't have put an equal sign there. I want to kind of convince you that they are equal and then later on I'll just, you know, say, okay, they're always going to be equal. That's what I'm building up, up to. But watch this. This is interesting because after the collision, it would look something like this. The kinetic energy would equal one half, and I would have the first one moving, and then I would have the second one moving. Now notice I'm just going to put a speed there, a V, because as we said, on this one when they stick together with the Velcro, they have the same speed. And so if I put in a one half, and then the mass is a half a kilogram, 
And then if I put in the speed, which we just did from the momentum over there, so this would be a good time to say it a second time or maybe even a third time, notice that to do this problem involving energy, I also had to do the problem of conservation of momentum. So let me not forget about conservation of momentum. And that's how I got that that speed after the collision. And then likewise here, the second one, which was stationary originally, would now be moving with a speed of, of two. And so if I run through this math, uh, two squared is a four, half of that is two, half of that is one. So this comes out to be one joule. And so remember a kilogram meter squared over a second squared is a joule. And it looks like the second one's the same numbers, so it would be one joule. And so there's a total of two joules. Now, if this was all there was, we would probably stop and say, well, clearly, before the collision we had four, and after we only had two. They're not equal. Okay, so I would say the kinetic energies aren't equal. That's true. But there's something else going on. Something else that um, we're going to study in more detail in chapters 11, 12, and 13. But maybe a clue will come in here. What is the difference between um, whoops, this collision where it bounces off and this collision where they stick. And of course the answer is they actually touch each other here where they stick. Uh, these two pieces of plastic actually run into each other. And on a microscopic scale, so you can't see it with your eyes, you need to remember that this material is all made out of atoms. And so these atoms bump into these atoms. And so as the atoms hit, not only does that push the cart forward, but the atoms that are inside that piece of metal hit each other and they start shaking like crazy. Now you might say that's a kinetic energy. Okay, sure, it's an internal kinetic energy. In fact, I brought this little demo out to try to try to show you and just in case you can't visualize what I, I just said is that on a microscopic level, what is the difference between something that is cold and something that is, is hot? And we like to do this. And I'll turn it up just a little bit. But there's BBs in here. And those BBs are bouncing around. But if I turn up the motor, if I turn up the voltage here, it'll look like this. <laughs> now they're moving really fast. And I'll turn it off because the thing is really noisy. Okay. But what I'm hoping you see here on the, on the video here is that when I have it on a low setting, the BBs are barely moving. And when I have it at a high setting, the BBs are moving a lot. And that's the mental picture I want you to have with these molecules that are right here on this cart. That before the collision, we might say they're kind of cool. They're probably the same as the room temperature. They're bouncing around a little bit. But when they collide, they start moving a lot faster. And, and, and here's what I'm trying to say. That besides the energy of motion that is clearly visible as the second cart begins to move, that, that was this calculation. I'm trying to say that there is an additional kinetic energy. We like to refer it to it as an internal kinetic energy. In fact, we like to call it heat energy. And so what I'm trying to show in this demonstration here is yes, energy is still conserved, 
but notice kinetic energy at least what we call bulk kinetic energy. The kinetic energy that you can see with your eyes is not conserved. Because if you only worry about the bulk kinetic energy, you would say there's only two joules here and that is less than the four. But I'm going to point out here that there is an additional two joules of energy for these molecules bouncing around. And so if I wanted to ask what is the total energy, I would take the bulk kinetic energy, so that's two joules, and I would add to that the heat energy, which is another two joules. And so that would be the two joules of energy. And so is the energy before equal to the energy after? Yes. If, and here's the key, you include all the objects and all the energies. See, this would not have worked if I only looked at one object. And it would not have worked if I only looked at one type of energy, the kinetic energy. And so this one's a, this, this property, conservation of energy, is I think a little bit harder than momentum. Momentum, we still kept emphasizing, you have to look at both objects. But we never talked about different types of momentum. And so all we had to do was to say, the momentum before has to equal the momentum after, and that only works if you look at all the objects. And I'm trying to say the same thing, but a step more that we have this principle called conservation of energy and you have to look at all the objects but you also have to look at all the forms of energy. Now it looks like I've about come to the end of my time here but I, I want to finish with with one more step here in this problem and so let me come back to the beginning just to kind of review this one here, cart number one, which got its original motion, I used the work energy equation, right? I said I put a force of 10 newtons for, uh, no, sorry, that was the other one. Uh, this one I did a force of 40 newtons. So I did a force of 40 newtons for 0.1 meters and that came out to be four joules. So it was my hand right here, this little part, let me stop it before it hits, but that little part right there is what gave it its four joules of energy. Then that four joules of energy comes and collides and when it collides two joules of energy are still in the bulk kinetic energy and two joules are in heat energy. And of course those two joules, let's come back to this calculation, of bulk kinetic energy were here. There was one joule in cart number one and one joule in cart number two. And so the last thing I want to do is to say, what if I did the work energy theorem again during this collision and I only looked at cart number one. Cart number one comes in here and it hits and the Velcro between them kind of squishes. Let's just say it squishes and hits for about one centimeter. It actually looks like it would be a little less than that, but I'm just going to have a simple number here. Could you tell me how much force was on cart number one? Which of course is equal and opposite to cart number two. Well, this would be a good example to continue this calculation and say, okay, force times distance would equal this one half mv squared. But it also lets me to show you a little subtlety that I need to emphasize before I kind of wrap up this part of the, of the lecture. This is really equal to 
the change in the kinetic energy. Uh, maybe I should write that as the change of one half mv squared. And I didn't emphasize that a few moments ago because what we were doing was going from zero up to some final. And so the change wasn't that important here. But I want to emphasize this change is crucial. Oh, well, watch. I'm going to come over to here. And let me start with the easier of the two objects. As they collide, <clears throat> if I start with the second object, and I think that's the easier one because it is stationary. And if I do this and I say force times distance is equal to the change in the kinetic energy. And the change is this one half mv squared. Oh, that would be a nice way of writing uh, one half mv final squared minus one half mv initial squared. But as I was saying, the second cart is the easy one. It matches what I was doing earlier because the initial speed was zero. And so in those other calculations where I was doing the work energy equation, uh, I did not include this. It, it, it wasn't necessary. And I did it hopefully in a way that got you started, but you won't stop there. Um, and so I I guess I'd say I cheated you a little bit. I, I, I didn't give you the full thing. It's actually the change in kinetic energy. But I wanted to give you the, the easy case here. And, and watch what happens here. If I look at cart number two, and I take the distance of the collision of one centimeter, and I'll put it in, in meters here, and I put then the mass of that one cart, and then I put in the final speed of cart number two. And so let's be careful here. What is the final speed of cart number two? Actually, maybe I should just come to here. But either place, it says that the final speed of number two is this two uh, meters per second squared. And so if I grab my calculator here, and maybe, actually, maybe I don't need a calculator for, for this one. This is a 4, half of that's a 2, half of that is a, a 1, and then a 1 divided by 100 make a 100. And then if I watch my units, a meter will cancel off, and I'll have kilogram meter per second squared, so that's a Newton. And so I would say, using the work energy equation, that the force on cart number 2, making it get up to that speed, of uh, two meters per second, needed a force of 100 newtons for that distance of one centimeter. And so that's how I would use the work energy theorem together with the conservation of energy uh, and the conservation of momentum here. But I think the more interesting one, and we better wrap it up here, is the um, cart number one when it hits the collision. And so if I do this same calculation, force times distance equals the change in kinetic energy. And that change then would be one half m v final squared minus one half v initial squared. This will give me a chance to show you what I call the harder case. The harder case is when you don't start or finish with a speed of zero because you have to have then both terms. And all the other times I was showing you the work energy equation, one of them was zero. Uh, but in this one, I would put a one half, and then the mass is a half a kilogram. And the final speed, as we said, after the collision is a two. And so here's a two meters per second squared. And the initial speed, as we said, came from the force of my hand making it move, which is a speed of 4 meters per second squared. And so if I get out my, well, see, maybe I can do it without a calculator, 4 
and then half and half make a one joule. Uh, minus then, uh, what's this, uh, 16, half of that's eight, and half of that is, is four. Uh, did I do that right? 16, eight, and four. And so this is a change Well, shoot, I, uh, yeah, I make, it, 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 this is going to look bad because it, this doesn't include the heat and I, shoot, shouldn't have uh, done it uh, quite this way. But let me just say that this, of course, is a loss of three joules. Uh, but what I've left off out of here, and this is where I messed up, is two of these joules were heat. And so what I wanted this to do, so let me subtract another two due to the heat. And so this is one joule. And I wanted you to see then, and, and it's, ne sorry, negative and it goes to heat. So... Ah, bummer, I was trying to rush and I kind of kind of messed this up here. But what I wanted you to see, and I'll just summarize it, the most important thing I wanted you to see is when you do these more advanced calculations, it's the change in kinetic energy. You have to take the final speed squared minus the initial speed squared, um, and then you get over here to the uh, work. But I wanted you to see then that then this force here, which slows it down, loses one joule. The other part of it goes to heat, that's two joules. And then the other part goes to the one joule that is making that first cart go. And uh, yeah, sorry, I kind of made that a little confusing at the, at the end there here. But well, we need to uh, wrap up here and call it quits and we will talk more in lab. All right, bye now.